listen, cause you're gonna hear a brand new story about a great engineer. He's the greatest of them all, we claim. Number one's his engine, Casey Jones, his name. Casey Jones, steaming and rolling. Good old Casey Jones. One of the most recognizable figures in American railroad history. If you were to ask any rail fan about the history of Casey Jones in the United States, they would instantly tell you. However, to the general public, they don't really know all that much about Casey Jones. Some questions that the general public might ask about Casey Jones was, who was he? Where was he born? What happened to him? And how did he live as a person? Well, today, in this 120th anniversary special, we'll be talking about the history of Casey Jones. This is Casey Jones' death, 120 years later. The legend of Casey Jones begins all the way back on March 14, 1863, near a small town in southeast Missouri. It is unknown, however, where Jones' town of birth is. Jones' original birth name was John Luther Jones. However, Jones got the nickname Casey when Jones was a young boy. His father, Frank Jones, school teacher, and his mother, Ann Nolan Jones, determined that the backwoods of Missouri offered little opportunity for their family. And subsequently, the Jones moved to Casey, Kentucky, the town that was the source of Jones' nickname Casey, and the name stuck, even when Jones was working in the railroad industry. While growing up in Kentucky, Jones was fascinated with the new world of railroads and always wanted to be a part of the railroad industry in one way or another. At the age of 15, Jones moved to Columbus, Kentucky and began working as a telegrapher for the Mobile and Ohio Railroad. In 1884, he moved to Jackson, Tennessee, where he was promoted at the m &O to the position of flagman. While living in a boarding house in Jackson, Jones met and fell in love with Joanne Brady, the daughter of a proprietor. Her father owned the boarding house where Jones stayed and the two met. The couple wed on November 26, 1886. Shortly thereafter, they moved into a place of their own in Jackson, Tennessee. They would have two sons and a daughter together. On his days on the Mobile in Ohio, Jones was very successful and quickly moved up the ranks. In 1891, Jones was offered a position at the Illinois Central Railroad as an engineer since his track record with the m and was good. As Jones worked with the Illinois Central, he quickly earned an unflattering reputation for being on time and never letting a delay stop him. However, he was often reckless and pushed the train to speeds that some engineers would never let through. This trait eventually made him popular with the workers at the Illinois Central and eventually went on after his death. Another reason why Jones was so well known is that he had a certain call whenever he would pass by a town or city. This whistle was known as the Whipper Will. It would sound like this. Whenever the townspeople heard that whistle, they would sometimes mutter, There goes Casey Jones. And since Casey Jones was well known, especially in the South, most Southern people knew what that whistle meant. Another interesting fact about Casey Jones is that he wasn't just a train addict, he was also an avid baseball fan and watched or participated in any game whenever his schedule allowed. During the 1880s, he played at Columbus, Kentucky while he was a cub operator at the Mobile and Ohio Railroad. One Sunday during the summer of 1898, the Water Valley Shop Team was scheduled to play the Jackson Shop Team and Jones got to haul the team to Jackson for the game. This was an interesting trait that was never truly known about Jones, even at the time. Since Jones was a newbie on the Illinois Central, he would take every kind of freight you can imagine for the railroad. Later in his career, the World Columbian Exposition was being held in Chicago in 1893. The Illinois Central was given the job to take the visitors in and out of the park grounds. The Illinois Central needed a group of engineers to take the thousands of visitors in and out of the park grounds, and Jones accepted this task without hesitation and took on his first passenger train duties. He spent the entire summer with his wife at the fairgrounds and took visitors in and out of the exposition. He took many passengers from Van Buren Street to Jackson Park throughout the whole exposition. 
While Jones was working at the exposition, he became attached with this new freight locomotive that the Illinois Central had just purchased. This new engine was a large 280 consolidation and was numbered 638. The Illinois Central had placed the locomotive on display during the exposition for public viewing. The engine at the time was the best technological advancement for the railroad industry. After the exposition was over, 638 was sent to Water Valley in Mississippi for service near the Jackson District. Jones had asked permission to drive the engine back to Water Valley, and his request was accepted. He drove over 500 miles from Chicago to Water Valley. Jones quickly loved 638 and the Jackson District in Tennessee because that's where his wife and kids lived. They had once briefly moved to Water Valley about 119 miles away in Mississippi, but returned to Jackson in Tennessee because they felt it was more like home. Jones drove 638 until he was transferred to Memphis in February of 1900. After he went to Memphis, he became attached with the engine that became the most famous with him. Illinois Central 382, affectionately known as Old 382 or the Cannonball. The engine was a Rogers built 360 10 wheeler bought new from the Rogers Locomotive Works in 1898. The engine was the most powerful at the time and eventually became well known with Jones's career later on. One of Jones's most well known traits while working in the railroad industry was that he was a very brave person. In his biography written by Fred J. Lee, in 1895, Jones was taking a train to Michigan City in Mississippi. He had gotten out of the cab, letting his other engineer, Bob Stevenson, take over command. Stevenson had reduced the speed of the locomotive for Jones to walk on the side of the locomotive to oil the relief valves. He then went to the piston of the locomotive while in motion to adjust the spark screen. He had finished before getting to the station and was walking back to the cab. As Jones was just about to get back in, he noticed something. A group of children had ran out 60 yards ahead. All cleared the tracks except for one little girl who froze in fear seeing that the train was coming. Jones shouted to Stevenson to reverse the throttle while he yelled at the little girl to get off the tracks. Realizing that she would just be frozen with fear, he ran up toward the cowcatcher of the locomotive and as the train approached picked her off the tracks. Gratefully, she was unharmed but very frightened. This incident was partially spoofed in the 1950 Disney cartoon, The Brave Engineer. However, the animators replaced the child with a damsel who was being tied up by a cliché bandit. Person. Oil the game! What do you know? Nonetheless, it is a unique aspect of his career that is unknown to a lot of people. Although Casey was a good engineer, in theory, he had a big file of citations, nine of them, with a total of 140 days of suspension. A year prior to his death, he hadn't received any citations. He was on the right track. The workers who worked with Jones said that they did like him, but he was always a risk taker and would sometimes throw others into danger from high speeds. This eventually proved to be his demise. April 30th, 1900. A day which will be known in infamy throughout the United States. There are several accounts of Jones' death, so the story is sometimes varied the way some may hear it. But the generally accepted one is Jones had taken on a double ship to clear up a sick engineer. He had just finished a run from Canton, Mississippi to Memphis, Tennessee and had to go back down south with 382 as his engine. Sam Webb was the fireman on board the train and later provided an account of the wreck since he was in the cab of 382. The train was running over an hour and a half late and Jones was determined to make up for lost time as he headed down south. Jones rattled the train down the tracks at speeds over 100 miles per hour or 160 kilometers per hour. As the train turned into Vaucan, Mississippi, through the thick fog and dark night, Webb looked out of the cab and recoiled in horror. As we came out of the curve, there right ahead of us were the red rear markers of a train. Showing red meant that it was on the main line. At once I yelled to Casey, 
Oh, my Lord, here's something on the main line. He jumped to his feet, looked diagonally across the top of the boiler, at the same time setting the air brakes in an emergency stop. Jones was trying to stop the train by hitting the emergency brakes and throwing the train into reverse. At the same time, he yelled at the other engineers to get off the tracks by sounding off the whistle as fast as possible. Jones had told Sam to jump out while he stayed on. Sam had said that the last words he knew from Jones were, You jump, Sam! I'll stay! Webb jumped and suffered only bruises on his way down, but Jones was less lucky. The collision was heinous. 382 slammed into the back of the caboose of the freight train. Amazingly, out of all the driver, firemen, conductors, and passengers aboard the three trains, all but one could tell the tale. Casey Jones, who was struck in the throat while holding one hand on the brake and one on the whistle. Legend has it that Jones was still clutching the brake and the whistle after medical services had arrived. After his death, the Illinois Central launched an investigation. After several months of interviews, they put together a final report. The reason why there were two freight trains on the same siding was because a doubleheader freight train number 83, located to the north and heading south, had been delayed due to having problems with two couplers pulled out while in Vaucan. If Jones's train and the doubleheader had been on time, the train would have safely passed and the doubleheader would have been right behind Jones's train. However, since he was delayed and since Jones was delayed, they had to wait at Vaucan. And Long Freight Train Number 72, located to the south and headed north, was on time. However, since the doubleheader and the other freight train met at the exact same time, they couldn't fit on the same siding. And since Jones was only a couple miles away, they had no time to get out of the way. Plus, the station at Vaucan was full with another train taking on more passengers so there was no way to warn. Reports indicate that Jones had a flag waved at him while running down the line, but apparently he didn't see it. However, this was never confirmed. As the combined length of the two trains for the doubleheader and the regular freight train was 10 cars longer than the length of the siding, this caused Casey's death. The next morning, Jones' body was transported on the long trip home to Jackson, Tennessee on a passenger train. On the following day, funeral service was held in St. Mary's Church in Jackson, where he and Joanne Brady had married 14 years before. He was buried at Mount Calvary Cemetery. Fifteen engine men rode 118 miles 190 kilometers from Water Valley to pay their last respects to Jones. Shortly after the funeral, Wallace Saunders, an engine wiper for the Illinois Central, wrote The Ballad of Casey Jones as a tribute since Saunders had admired Jones. The song was later adapted by William Lightman and sold to vaudeville artists. The song became well known and made Jones into an American legend. 382 was rebuilt by the Illinois Central and the Water Valley Shops in Mississippi and was put back into service. However, the locomotive had a curse after Jones' death. Six lives were lost and wasn't retired until July of 1935. The locomotive has also changed numbers several times from 212, 2012, and 3012. Three years after Jones' death, criminals caused 382 to crash, nearly demolishing the engine. Harry A. Norton, who replaced Jones, lost both his legs and was badly scalded. Unfortunately, his firemen and an onlooker had died when the locomotive fell on them and it was subsequently burnt to death. In September of 1905, Norton and 382 flipped over while in the Memphis South Yards in Tennessee. However, Norton was uninjured this time because the engine was moving slowly. And finally, on January 22, 1912, 382, now number 2012, crashed and killed four prominent railroad workers and injured several more. This accident was known as the Camundi Wreck of 1912 because the wreck happened in Camundi, Illinois. An engineer by the name of Strood was driving. 
Jones's first engine he loved, Illinois Central 638, was sold to the Mexican government in 1921 and ran in Mexico for the rest of its life. It was scrapped sometime in the 1950s or 1960s. As for 382, after it was retired in July of 1935, it was unceremoniously scrapped shortly thereafter. Now some of you might be thinking, wait a minute, if 382 was scrapped, then why is it still here? Well, I'll tell you. The Carolina, Clinchfield, and Ohio Railroad, better known as the Clinchfield Railroad, had a similar locomotive of 382, number 99, and after it was retired, it was painted as Illinois Central 382. It is now on display at the historic Casey Jones Railroad Museum in Jackson, Tennessee. Some other museums named in Jones's honor include the Water Valley Casey Jones Railroad Museum in Water Valley, Mississippi, and the Casey Jones Railroad Museum State Park in Volcan, Mississippi, which has unfortunately closed in 2004. 120 years have passed since Casey Jones' death. Many songs, short TV specials, references, and even TV shows have been made about Casey Jones in his honor, but 120 years later, the memories of the stories of Casey Jones are still fresh, and I hope they will never die.